Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for another true crime video and as a reminder, this is part two. So if you haven't seen part one yet, you should check the description box and watch that first because one comes before two always, even in 2020 where nothing else makes sense and probably going into 2021 where things still seem to not be making sense. So in part one, we talked a little bit about Barbara Hamburg's life and family. We talked about her marriage to who she thought at the time was the man of her dreams. We talked about how she became the mother of two children and how much she loved being their mom. But we also talked about the many contentious court battles she and her ex-husband Jeffrey Hamburg went through in the years after their divorce and before her death on March 3rd, 2010. Today, we're going to go deeper and discuss the potential theories of who could have taken Barbara's life and why. But before we get started, I'd like to have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. In this video, we're partly discussing a docu-series I watched on HBO, but if you like documentaries, Magellan TV is the place for you. It's a new type of documentary streaming service created by those who know what makes a compelling film, documentary filmmakers themselves. They currently have over 3,000 documentary films in series, and they add more every single week. One of my favorite things to do when I open the Magellan TV app is to go into the new releases section to see what they've added, and on that note, for those of you who have already signed up or who are considering signing up, I have a recommendation that was in that section this week. It's called Behind Bars, the World's Toughest Prisons, and it brings you behind the gates, walls, and into the cells of the world's toughest maximum security prisons. It's 13 episodes, so there's plenty to watch, which I love. You know, for me, the longer the better, so I love that there's 13 episodes included in this. And it talks about prisons such as Tent City Jail in Phoenix, Arizona, La Mesa in Mexico, and South Catabato Jail in the Philippines. So whether you're interested in true crime, history, science, nature, or really anything else, Magellan TV has more than enough to keep you entertained and educated. And you can watch Magellan TV anytime, anywhere, on your smartphone, tablet, laptop, even on your smart TV. You can start a film on your phone and finish it later on your TV when you get home without losing your place. The app is so easy to use, so well organized. I think that you'll understand where I'm coming from when I say like the app makes all the difference for streaming services. If it's glitchy or messy or just isn't organized or clean looking, it doesn't matter how good the content is, but Magellan TV's app is perfect, simple, and beautifully streamlined. Magellan TV is offering viewers of this channel a one-month free trial. All you have to do is click the link in the description box and start watching. There's no strings attached, no contracts to sign, no tricks. You can cancel anytime before your trial ends, but I don't think you're going to want to because once you get into Magellan TV and see all there is, it's really hard to stop watching. It really is. Like, there's so much that I, I think there's at least six or seven things in my queue that I want to watch that I'm looking forward to watching. And I've kind of starred so that I can watch them later. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. And let's jump back in. Okay, so the most obvious suspect is Barbara's ex husband, Jeffrey Hamburg. And this is for multiple reasons. Women are far more likely to die at the hands of someone who's known to them. Women killed by domestic partners or family members makes up 58% of all female homicide victims globally. In this case, Barbara and Jeff Hamburg were not on the best terms. And there was money at stake, a lot of it. He owed her money. And if he didn't pay it, he was going to wind up in jail. And the timing of her murder is lost on no one. The day she was supposed to appear in court to collect this money that he was claiming he didn't have, she ended up dead. And this murder would have had to have happened in a pretty small window of time. Barbara dropped her 16-year-old daughter, Allie, off to school a little bit before 8 a.m. And as far as we know, she went right home. Due to the crime scene, it doesn't look like she ever got inside the house. Allie had said that before they'd made it to school that morning, they'd stopped at Willoughby's, a coffee shop, and there was a coffee cup found on the front porch near the broken dog statue, which indicated a struggle. 
So it's believed that when Barbara got home, someone was already lying in wait for her and she was attacked on her way to the front door. 44 Middle Beach Road is a pretty secluded property. As you can see here on Google Earth, the property sits uh, pretty far back from the main road and is surrounded by trees, which would hamper the vision of even close by properties. During the documentary, Barbara's son Madison went back to the house with a private investigator and revealed a little bit more about the scene of the crime. Barbara's purse and keys found in the yard, the coffee cup and broken dog statue by the front door. We talked about those things, but further down the yard, closer to the end of the driveway, probably right about here, there was a wooden pallet found just lying in the grass. And when investigators lifted the pallet, they found a great deal of blood. So the most likely scenario of how this went down is Barbara gets home from dropping Allie off to school. She parks her car in the driveway, walks to the front door, gets onto the front porch, and someone was there. I'm not sure if this person immediately attacked her or if they stepped out of the shadows and scared her. But at one point, it's believed that she began to run, dropping her coffee by the front door, possibly knocking into the dog statue, causing it to fall and break, dropping her keys in the yard, dropping her purse a little further down the yard, all while being pursued. But before she had reached the end of her own yard, she was taken down. And it's believed that where the pallet was found was where she was murdered due to the large amount of blood found there. At that point, whoever attacked her dragged her body around to the back of the house and covered it with patio cushions, most likely found in the garage because it was March and most people still have their patio furniture stored away or covered until warmer weather arrives. Now, there's a few reasons why the culprit may have covered Barbara with cushions, but the private investigator that Madison was working with doesn't believe it was to hide the evidence of his or her crime, since none of the other evidence was cleaned up, such as the sign of a struggle at the front door or Barbara's personal belongings in the front yard. The investigator believes that both the blood on the lawn and the body were covered up out of guilt. Staging the scene in this way can suggest an emotional attachment to the victim, or even a sign that the murderer acted out of raw emotion and then immediately regretted what they had done. I'm kind of on the fence in this case. I think it could be either or, or even a mixture of both. Even though the house was pretty far away from the main road, the perpetrator would still want to have time to get away, and most likely he or she would be in a rush. So the covering of the body and the blood the most obvious and glaring signs of foul play may have been all they had time to do since an errant purse or a set of keys lying in the front yard aren't going to send off immediate alarm bells to like a neighbor who happens to be walking by, whereas a puddle of blood and or a dead body certainly would. Now, during the making of the documentary, Madison had several meetings with the Madison Police Department. So Madison is his name, and it's the Madison Police Department. This, this got confusing for me, too. So I was just hoping to clear that up before it became confusing for anybody out there. But Barbara's son is named Madison, and they lived in Madison. So Barbara's son, Madison, had several meetings with the Madison Police Department, and he recorded many of these interactions with them without their knowledge. Now, this was a tricky one for me because technically Connecticut is a two-party consent state, which means both of the people in the conversation need to know that they're being recorded and they need to give permission for that to happen. But then I looked a little deeper into it and it seems like there's a loophole to this almost. If the recordings meet the requirement of federal law, they can be admissible in court even if they were illegally obtained without the knowledge of the other person. Since Madison was recording his conversations with the police specifically to be used in the documentary and not even necessarily to be used in a court of law, I think that's why he ended up being okay. But later in the fourth episode, if I remember correctly, it was the fourth episode, during an FOIA hearing, one of the police officers he recorded found out that he had recorded the conversation. And this police officer looked kind of pissed. I'll see if I can screen record it and show you without getting like hit with a copyright claim. But his face, he's just like, almost like he's thinking like, I should have known this kid was doing this, but I didn't. And now I'm mad at myself and I feel stupid and I look stupid, but I'll see if I can put it in for you. 
Anyways, in 2013, when he first started working on the film, Madison called the police department and he asked, you know, do you think I'll be able to interview you guys for the documentary? And they respond basically saying, no, it's an open case and the police chief would never allow that to happen. But they do ask if he will come in, sit down with them, and answer a few of their questions, which he does, and he records the conversation on his cell phone. During this conversation, the police tell Madison that they had found a cigarette butt at the scene, uh, the scene of his mother's murder, that does not lead back to his father, Jeffrey Hamburg, but leads back to him, Madison. And Madison admits, you know, yeah, I was smoking at that time, but... He wasn't living there at his mother's house. So in my opinion, what probably happened here is that Madison had probably come to visit his mother at some time over the past winter, most likely around the holidays. He probably smoked a cigarette while he was outside, threw it into the snow, and it wouldn't be seen until the snow melted, which it had by March. It was still cold in Connecticut in March, but the snow had melted for the most part. But the police also told him that they'd recovered DNA from underneath Barbara's fingernails, and it was DNA from the male Hamburg line. That's when they start telling him that they have not been able to eliminate his father, Jeffrey Hamburg, as a suspect. And the only way that they can actually eliminate him for good is if Jeff tells them his whereabouts on that day, something concrete that can be verified. Which, in my opinion, makes it seem to me like Jeffrey Hamburg never told the police where he was that day. He never gave them an alibi. But that's just my opinion from what I saw in the documentary. Madison is then asked by the police, quote, You know your father better than anybody. Is he capable of something like this? And Madison responds that he's never seen his father be violent towards anyone. The police then ask if Jeffrey is controlling. And Madison responds, quote, he is very controlling and manipulative and selfish, end quote. The subject of whether or not Jeffrey Hamburg has offshore bank accounts arises in this conversation with the police asking, where did all the money go? Madison says, you know, he has no idea if his father has offshore bank accounts and anything that Jeffrey had ever done overseas had always been kept a secret from him, but he too is interested in knowing where all the money went because there was a time when Jeff Hamburg was a multi-millionaire but he doesn't have any money now, so where did it all go? Conversations with the police were not the only ones that Madison recorded. He also recorded several conversations with his father, and there's one thing that remains constant throughout every single one of them. Anytime Madison brings up Barbara's death or asks about what happened with all their money since they used to be wealthy and then all of a sudden Jeff was crying broke, Jeffrey Hamburg refuses to talk about it. He keeps saying, I'm not going to answer any questions about this. I don't want to talk about this, etc. And it seems to me, in my opinion, that he possibly may have been coached by his lawyer to respond in this way. And let's talk about that lawyer, criminal defense attorney Hugh Keefe. It seemed that after Barbara was dead, Jeffrey kind of dropped off the map and immediately hired Hugh Keefe, who spoke on his behalf to the press on March 6th, saying that Jeffrey was still in the state and any reports of him being in hiding were just not true. Keefe claimed that his client had spoken to the police by phone on Wednesday, the day of the murder. But that really doesn't add up to the information given by the chief of police in the press conference the following Friday, which was March 5th. So on March 5th, um, the police say, we are looking to find Jeffrey Hamburg. We can't find him. And then on March 6th, Hugh Keefe is like, Jeffrey's not in hiding. Jeffrey's still here. There's nothing going on here. Don't look. Don't ask questions. And Jeff's already talked to the police. At this time, we're seeking to uh, locate her former husband, Jeffrey Hamburg. So if Jeff talked to the police on Wednesday and was being cooperative, why would they be asking for the public to be on the lookout for him on Friday? So just from pure speculation based on the evidence, it looks like Jeff Hamburg wasn't really being all that cooperative. And days after the murder of his ex-wife, he had yet to meet with the police in person, which is suspicious, as is hiring a criminal defense attorney the second your ex-wife turns up dead. But Hugh Keefe claimed that he thinks this is what anyone would have done in Jeff's position, knowing that they were going to be the most likely suspect, and he could be absolutely right. Now, when the police were asked if they knew where Jeff Hamburg was at this time, like between the, the day of Barbara Hamburg's death and the day of Hugh Keefe speaking to the press, 
they wouldn't really come right out and say. All they would say is that they were seeking to question him about this incident, which to me is a hard no, but that's just my opinion. So we're going to go on the assumption that within the days after the murder, Jeffrey Hamburg did not make himself accessible to the police for questioning. And no one really knew where he was. The police had recovered a small amount of DNA from the crime scene. And on March 17th, Jeffrey Hamburg finally provided police with a hair sample and a sample of his DNA taken with an oral swab. Here's where things get tricky. At the time of Barber's murder, they were building a brand new state-of-the-art forensics science lab in Meridian, Connecticut. And the police asked the family if it would be okay to wait until after that lab was finished being built before running the DNA found at Barbara's crime scene. The family, after being told that this new lab would be the best, you know, the most cutting edge, the best technology, the best people... And that it would give them their best chance of getting accurate results, they agreed to this. But between Barbara's autopsy and the completion of the new lab, which happened on April 23, 2010, Barbara was cremated and laid to rest per family tradition. And when the DNA was finally run through the new lab, they alleged that the DNA found at the scene did not match Jeffrey Hamburg or anyone else for that matter. It was unidentifiable. Now, I'm not sure if this DNA is the same DNA that was found under Barbara's fingernails, but something makes me think it was different DNA. Since clearly in 2013, when Madison talked to the police, they had at least tracked the fingernail DNA to a male member of the Hamburg family. But they're seeing that this DNA found at the scene and run through this fancy new Connecticut crime lab was not identifiable, didn't match anybody in the system. But let's talk about this fancy new crime lab that Connecticut was opening and why it became a point of contention, a problem in this case. They opened in April of 2010, and by August of 2011, they had lost their accreditation. According to KamornaLaw.com, the Connecticut State Crime Lab lost its ASCLD lab accreditation because of concerns relating to evidence control, quality assurance, and management. And this led to an enormous backlog of cases. Nearly 12,000 cases submitted to the lab were sitting on a shelf collecting dust because without its accreditation, they wouldn't have access to resources such as CODIS and its 12 million offender profiles. Why is this important to Barbara's case? Well, in 2019, Madison sat down with a police officer, a Detective Suddick, and not knowing he was being recorded, Detective Suddick revealed all sorts of things. Later, Madison would file an FOIA request on his mother's case. And for those of you who don't know, FOIA stands for Freedom of Information Act. And this act covers quite a bit, including government documents, things like that, unless you want to know who killed Kennedy And then you'll find that it's all still redacted and you can't get it. But for the purposes of today's video, it basically means that you have the right to certain information as a citizen of the United States. And the information that Madison wanted was anything pertinent to the investigation into who had killed his mother. But the Madison Police Department fought back and denied this request. So Madison had to go to a hearing with representatives from the FOIA commission And the goal was to show that Barbara's case had gone cold. It had been 10 years since her death. The police didn't seem to be moving forward. And although they were claiming it was still an open case, which is a loophole, by the way, many law enforcement officials will use the the claim that it's an open case to deny these requests. I've run into it many, many times. But in Madison's situation, he wanted to prove that his mother's case was only an open case in name, not in actuality. And Madison knew this because of a conversation he'd had with Detective Suddick in 2019. During this conversation, Detective Suddick said they'd basically reached a dead end in this case. They had done hundreds and hundreds of interviews. They were getting no new tips. No one had made an anonymous call with new information or written a letter with new information. And this detective said, quote, we've got nothing, end quote. Detective Suddick also revealed that they did have one primary suspect, but it had been the same suspect they'd had since March 7th of 2010, four days after the murder. And he said, quote, we know for a fact our number one suspect's phone was turned off for a 24-hour period, end quote. Now, in my opinion, Detective Suddick 
was pretty much saying, we know who did this, we just can't prove it. And in this conversation, the detective also said, quote, the DNA kits were crap. They were all expired, end quote. So that's a lot to unpack. Let's address the DNA kits that Suddick claimed were crap and expired. And then in the FOIA hearing, he claimed he didn't remember using the word crap, but he, he remembered talking about the DNA kits, but he couldn't remember for the life of him using the word crap, even though he was recorded saying it. Now, this information that the DNA kits used at this new Connecticut crime lab, the DNA kits used to test the evidence that was found at the scene of Barbara's murder, that information hand in hand with the issues that were raised at the Connecticut Crime Lab that caused them to lose their accreditation, it casts some doubt on the validity of the inevitable results, which ended up clearing Jeffrey Hamburg. And don't get me wrong, I understand the purposes of denying an FOIA request within a year or two years or even three years of a crime. But Detective Sodic clearly said they had nothing. They had no leads. They were at a standstill. So to me, this is no longer an active investigation. The police have done everything in their power to solve it or bring someone to justice, and they haven't solved it a decade later. So what is the harm in allowing some fresh eyes to look at the evidence? What is the harm in that? What is the harm in giving the family member of a victim the ability to kind of investigate this case themselves since you weren't able to do your job? Well, you know, during the FOIA hearing, all of a sudden, Detective Sudik claims, oh, well, there has been movement on this case. Yes, there has been new developments. Just seven days before the FOIA hearing, he claims he interviewed someone with new information. So there you go. It's an active and open investigation. Very convenient. But when he's asked by um, the FOIA representatives, you know, is this someone you've talked to before or is this a new person? He's like, uh, I don't I don't want to say like this is the whole point of why we're here. We don't want to give you information that's going to hinder the investigation. And if we reveal this information to you, it could hinder the investigation. So this seems very calculated and manipulative, if you ask me. But that's just my opinion. We have family members of Barbara who are looking for answers, who desperately need closure. And the Madison Police Department, after admitting that they had nothing and there's nothing else they could do, They're trying to actively keep the information of the investigation away from Madison and his crew, who are now actively trying to solve his mother's murder. It just seems petty and awful. What are they trying to protect? What are they trying to hide? And it's almost like a slap in the face and an insult to anyone's intelligence who's following this case for this dude to be like telling Madison, we have nothing. We've had no new leads. It's been 10 years. Nobody's called. Nobody's written. <laughs> Nobody, Nobody's coming in. Nothing's happening. And then to sit in the FOIA hearing and be like, oh, yeah, I just had a new break uh, a week ago. We had somebody, you know, come in and I interviewed them. But then when asked to elaborate, you know, as to like show proof that this is actually happening and this isn't just something you're saying, because like Detective Sudik, your imaginary friend who sat down and gave you information about Barbara Hamburg doesn't count as a new lead. So like actually show the receipts, give us some information, even if it's something small. We're not asking for this person's name. We're not asking for what they said. We want to know if this is a new person that you've interviewed or if this was somebody you already interviewed in the initial investigation and you're re-interviewing. Because if it's somebody you already interviewed and you're re-interviewing, that doesn't really count as new information. But he wouldn't even do that. You know, he, he wouldn't even do that. So in episode four, Madison goes to his aunt Conway's house and she has a bunch of Barbara's papers and documents, personal effects, things like that. And as Madison is looking through them, he finds a letter that his mother wrote to her divorce attorney four or five years before she died. And there's all sorts of inflammatory stuff in there that we need to dig into. Barbara said in the letter that in the 13 years she and Jeff had been married, he started a number of companies, and one of them brought him overseas to the Middle East. Jeff was also very paranoid about his business deals, and he refused to discuss them in detail with his wife. He felt that his phones were being tapped and that his mail was being tampered with, and eventually he made the decision to basically live in the Middle East and just visit his family back in Connecticut. And that's when, you know, she filed for divorce. 
Barbara claimed that is also when the FBI started coming around, looking for her husband. They came to her home on a number of occasions, but Jeff was always out of the country. Barbara claimed that Jeff was being investigated for money laundering to the tune of $200 million. And he was using an oil barge in the Middle East to do this money laundering. She said he had three passports, all with different names on them, and he was basically into some shady business dealings that made her afraid. Barbara was also afraid that Jeff would take her children, and he'd allegedly told her that if anyone came looking for him, whether it be the government or not, he would make sure she went down with him. She said, quote, I also have documents, computer disks, names, bank accounts, and more that would benefit the Interpol investigation. They are kept in a safe place with instructions to be sent to Interpol in the event something should happen to me, end quote. So Madison obviously tries to find these things that Barbara referred to in the letters, going through his mother's boxes and belongings, and he found a bunch of paperwork for companies that he'd never heard of, which were doing hundreds of millions of overseas transactions. And when I say hundreds of millions, I don't mean the amount. I mean like the monetary amount, hundreds and millions of dollars of overseas transactions. And these papers had his father's name on them and their home address on them. So Madison ends up showing these things to a professor of economic crime at Utica College, and this woman's name was Suzanne Lynch. And together, they basically came to the conclusion, based on the information they had, that all the different businesses were shell corporations, which did not actually exist off of paper. And these shell corporations were specifically used for the purpose of fraud, specifically something called a prime bank program, where people buy and sell bank guarantees and use them to invest money into different banks. So I went to the SEC website to find more out about these prime bank program scams. And in no uncertain terms, the website says... All prime bank investment programs are fraudulent. Promoters of prime bank programs often claim that investors' funds will be used to buy and trade supposed bank instruments and that investors will receive guaranteed high investment returns with little or no risk. These promoters of the scams will attempt to make the schemes look legitimate by using complex, sophisticated, and official-sounding terms, but it is a scheme nonetheless, and you will lose your money. So... Suzanne tells Madison, in these scams, these letters are fake, and much of the verbiage used in those letters that Madison found was total fraud. She said it was all smoke and mirrors, and there was no actual reasonable or like legal explanation for any of it. Now remember from the first video, Barbara's brother Richard had been brought into one of Jeffrey's companies, Road Track. And Jeff told Richard, you know, they were trying to get people to invest. You would put a million in, and six months later, you would get $10 million in return, a.k.a. high investment returns with little or no risk. And Barb Lund, Barbara's mother, admitted that she had invested in Jeffrey's companies. The first few times, she'd gotten her money back. But the last time, she never saw the money again, and it was $125,000. It was the money she'd been planning to retire with, and now it's gone. Barbara's first divorce attorney told Madison that his father was always doing these deals overseas, but they never made any sense. Now, Madison later confronts his father with this information, and this is when they meet in person in New York City, where Jeffrey was living at the time that this documentary was filmed, I believe. Um, the day with Madison and Jeffrey seems to be going fine. You know, they're trying to reconnect. They're trying to bond. It's been years since they've really seen each other. You know, the relationship's kind of strained to begin with. So I think Madison was being very careful in the beginning. But again, towards the end of the night, he brings up the subject of his mother's death and the past. And at this point, Madison and Jeffrey are literally in a car driving. Madison's in the driver's seat. And as soon as the subject gets brought up, Jeff like undoes his seatbelt and he wants to get out of the car as they are literally driving. He doesn't even want to wait for Madison to park somewhere. This is odd behavior, the behavior of someone who's cornered, a caged animal, someone who just wants to get away. You know, he gets very defensive and he shuts down as soon as Barbara or, you know, business affairs are brought up. But when Madison talks about the paperwork he found with all the business dealings on them, Jeffrey suddenly seems interested almost in spite of himself. Madison tells Jeffrey some of the company names and bank names that he found, and Jeff launches right into, you know, 
I don't know what you're talking about. I don't believe these papers exist. I'd have to see them. Then he backpedals a little, and he claims, you know, that he tried his hand at trading oil once, but it didn't work out. But get this. Madison had emails that his mother had written claiming she was contacted by the Connecticut police and was actually brought into the police station to discuss this investigation into Jeffrey Hamburg. And the investigator who brought her in on behalf of Interpol informed Barbara that Jeff Hamburg had offshore bank accounts in Switzerland and in the Cayman Islands. Barbara also told family members that the police believed Jeff was being used as a money launderer or a mule. Now, according to Jeff, this was all fabricated in the mind of his ex-wife, who was malicious and not as nice as everyone thought she was. He said that in her drunken stupor, Barbara herself had called the police on him and told them that Jeff was a money launderer. He then talked to the police and they found nothing. At the end of this conversation, Jeff tells Madison that he's just going to have to eventually say to himself one day, I can't figure this out, which in my opinion is just another way of Jeff telling his son, Stop trying to figure this out, but that's just my opinion. Now, there could, in reality, be no truth to any of this. Barbara did have a few bad years with alcohol. She was angry. She was hurt. She felt abandoned. And it's very possible that she made it all up to get back at her husband for abandoning their family. But this would be a very intricate sort of scheme. I mean, she would have to be truly playing the long game. That would mean that she would have needed to fake all these documents, bank accounts, company names, etc. And then just like leave them someplace and hope one day that they would be found. Or maybe she created all this stuff hoping to show it to the police and get Jeff in trouble. But when they didn't buy it, she just gave up. I don't know. But it's obviously possible. She was hurt. Jeffrey Hamburg was her Prince Charming, and he turned out to, to just not be that. She was disappointed. Her hopes and dreams for all those bright and rosy years in her future had been shattered by him. She could have been incredibly angry. However, something helpful did come from Madison's talks with his father. Jeffrey told his son during an in-person meeting in 2016 that Barbara had been involved in some sketchy things and that if Madison wanted to know more, he should ask her family, specifically her sister, Conway Beach, and her aunt, Jill Platt. And that's where we're introduced to the gifting tables, another layer of intrigue to this already complicated case. After the divorce, Course, Barbara wasn't in a great place emotionally or financially, and she began drinking a lot more heavily. Barbara told those close to her that she was in a really dark place. She would sometimes drink so much she'd black out, and her sister Conway claimed that sometimes when she would call Barbara at night to talk, her call would be answered, but sometimes it wouldn't be. One night, Barbara was arrested for a DUI, and Conway claims that Barbara called her up and said, I need help or I'm going to die. So Conway took her in for treatment, and when Barbara returned, she was a changed woman with a new circle of friends, a new community in AA. Once she'd been sober long enough, Barbara began sponsoring other women, and her relationships in AA were very tight-knit. Everyone loved and trusted her a great deal, and they could tell how badly she wanted to help others overcome the same obstacles she had, much in the same way her father, Sandy Beach, had done. And although this helped a great deal with her emotional strife, Barbara was still facing money problems. Not receiving any financial support from her ex-husband, she ended up cashing out her IRA to stay afloat, and she was a prime candidate to be targeted by an MLM, which is exactly what happened. Enter Jill Platt, who we have mentioned just briefly before, I think in part one. Jill was married to Barbara's uncle, Ed, who she'd met in high school. And as adults, Jill and Barbara became close friends. Jill was involved with something called gifting tables that were popping up all over the shoreline of Connecticut. And she invited Barbara to join these tables, telling her it would basically solve her financial troubles. Now, the gifting tables were posed to the women who joined almost as like a social club. But without a doubt, they are pyramid schemes. And this pyramid scheme had an almost secret society tinge to it. They used code words when they were around others and even when they were with each other to refer to the different levels of the pyramid. They were instructed to not tell others about the tables and to only invite women who were good candidates and who could also keep their mouths shut. I'm going to try to explain this 
um, the best way to you that I can before talking about how it enters into our story today. Luckily, I watched a really helpful video from a channel called BCG Crime Watch, so go check him out. He really helped me understand the structure of this pyramid scheme because I'm not well versed on um, MLMs and things like that. So this gifting table thing, it would be a four level pyramid. And at the top, you have your dessert level. And all the levels are named after like dinner courses. So the woman in the dessert position is usually the one who started the table. And there would be multiple tables happening at any given time, sometimes in the same like cities, the same areas. So the dessert woman is going to recruit or invite two other women in. And in order to join the table, you have to do two things. You have to bring a $5,000 gift and recruit or invite two other women who were able to bring the same gift. <laughs> now, these two women are called entrees, and the $10,000 that they bring in combined is given or gifted to the woman in the dessert position. So the two entrees bring in another two women each, and these four women will be called salads. And they also bring a gift of $5,000 each, which goes to the dessert lady. So this woman at the top of the pyramid has now made $30,000, and no one else has made a thing. In fact, they've all spent money. They've invested money or they've gifted money. And that's what they've done in order to be included at this table. Now the salads have to invite two women each who will also bring a $5,000 gift, which totals $40,000, all going to the woman in the dessert position. So now she's she's rolling in the deep, right? She's She's got a lot of money and it's cash, always cash. So she's all about the Benjamins, the tax-free Benjamins, bringing home $70,000 from this fun ladies social club. And she had to give money to who? No one. That's right. No one. Okay. So once the dessert lady gets paid out, she steps aside. She leaves the table. But this doesn't mean that she can't go out and start a whole new table with a whole new group of women and start in the dessert position again and do this all over again and again as many times as she wants or is able to. Once the dessert lady leaves, the two entrees move into the dessert position. So now you've got two desserts and the table continues to grow as the desserts basically run their own little groups and everyone moves up a course. So the appetizers are now salads, the salads are now entrees, and everyone's over here thinking, I can't wait to be a dessert so I can stop paying money and I can actually like make some money. But to be fair, the salads and the entrees are not expected to, to keep paying money. They've already paid their money. So once you pay your 5000 you don't pay again. Only the new appetizers are paying the money, the new appetizers that everyone's bringing in. So the sum of the money that goes to the new desserts is less than the $70,000, but it's still $40,000. So, I mean, it's nothing to sneeze at. And after every round, the desserts take their money and they run. And the entrees step into their dessert positioning, doubling the amount of pyramids each time. So you can understand, as more and more women are brought in, how things could get a little tricky especially when you're running around small towns like Madison, Connecticut. And the women involved in these tables use specific verbiage to avoid the attention of law enforcement and also to avoid paying taxes on these cash payments that they're receiving. Um, the words that they use, they say things like, we don't recruit, we invite. It's not an investment, it's a gift. We don't get paid, we receive. And if someone would question the legality of all this, they'd be told, don't worry, it's completely legal. And they'd cite tax law, such as, you know, everyone's allowed to receive a gift of up to $12,000 a year per person without paying taxes on it. So see, there's nothing wrong or nefarious here. We're just women supporting other women in this sisterhood of love and acceptance unless you don't have your $5,000 and then you better go find a way to get it. And I'm being serious here. Potential table members would be given a handbook and inside was a list of ways to manifest your gift if you didn't have the cash on hand. You could sell your car. You could get a second job and use that money for your gift. You could ask for an advance on an inheritance. You could borrow money from your family. You could refinance your house. There's tons of ways to get your gift. Just be creative and don't tell anyone, ever. Barbara got involved in this with Jill Platt, who was apparently doing all right, considering her son remembered her keeping tens of thousands of dollars in their freezer at home. 
So Jill must have been the dessert several times. And then Barbara invited her sister Conway, and for a while, everyone was happy. They were moving up in the courses. They were making money. Rinse, repeat. Start your table, make your money, do it all over again with different women. But apparently, Barbara made a few bad choices of who she ended up inviting to her table. Barbara ended up developing a very large dinner party, and some of the people in her downline were women she had met and befriended through AA. And this was very much frowned upon by the other tables, as it should be. And then Barbara invited Jill Platt's little sister into her table, and Jill did not like this at all. Jill and her sister Tracy had never been close, like as kids. Um, Tracy said Jill was always mean to her, so she had no reservations in accepting Barbara's invitation to her table. But Jill was opposed to this since Tracy was not the right type of person to invite. The right type of person to invite was someone who had the means to actually bring the gift or manifest the gift. But not only that, someone who had friends who also had the means to bring the gift and could be invited to the table. And Jill claims Tracy did not fit that bill. Tracy had no money. She didn't have a job. She was depressed. She was mentally fragile. And she had no friends who had money. And this made her not only the wrong kind of candidate, but a very dangerous kind of person to bring in. It was at this point that a rift formed between Jill's table and Barbara's table, and they sort of split off um, gifting table wars, (laughs) which made it very awkward for everyone involved because they had all gotten along before, and now it was just weird. You know, like Jill and, and Barbara, they weren't talking. And Jill said in the documentary that she didn't feel it was right to invite women from AA or women like her sister Tracy because you should only be inviting those who have a chance to actually succeed, not people who are down and out, not people who are desperate for money because you don't always reach that dessert level quickly, right? Sometimes it takes weeks or even months, and you might have a lot of women in those appetizer and salad levels wondering, when's my time going to come? I've paid in all this money but I have nothing to show for it. And that's apparently exactly what happened. A woman who was allegedly from Barbara's AA group, but who has remained anonymous, went to the attorney general to tell them she'd been scammed. And she even showed them her manual with all the guidelines, you know, the table's secrets and all of that. Now, the gifting tables were in all the papers and on the news, being called horrible things like Ponzi schemes and pyramid schemes, which made it that much more difficult to recruit anyone. I mean to invite people in. So you've got all these women in the appetizer position who have paid their money, but now they can't get anyone else to come in and pay their money because everyone's heard about it on the news. So it all comes to a slamming standstill. No one's moving up. And there were suddenly a lot more women who felt scammed since no one was moving up. An investigation into the tables was opened in November of 2009 with the complainant stating that they had been lured in with the promise of sisterhood and their trust had been betrayed by the predatory desserts. And of course, Jill at this time was a dessert, as well as another woman in the area named Donna Bello. And when Barbara Hamburg was murdered, she was also in the dessert position. Now, after this, Jill Platt never spoke to Barbara again. And in the documentary, Jill told Madison, if it wasn't for your mom, none of this would have happened. She felt that Barbara had been careless, that Barbara and Conway had gotten greedy and invited too many people without giving thought to the type of people that they were bringing in. And before she died, Barbara admitted that she regretted bringing women from AAN because maybe they weren't strong enough. There was some speculation as to whether Jill Platt had been responsible for Barbara's murder, but Jill's alibi actually seems to check out. She was on the road driving to Barb Lund's house in Virginia, but that doesn't remove any of the other women who were involved in Barbara's table or even a competing table who were mad at Barbara for kind of like bringing this whole scam to an end. It also doesn't exclude anybody who felt victimized by these tables. Some of these women involved may have done some atypical things to get the money, thinking that they were going to come out of the deal with at least $40,000, and maybe they hadn't told their husbands about it until they realized that they weren't going to get the money back. And maybe these husbands or boyfriends or fathers were pissed and wanted revenge on the woman who was responsible, which was Barbara. There are a few incidences that support the theory that someone was angry with Barbara and had been for at least a few weeks before she died. Barbara told Conway that she felt she was being watched and the mailbox on her house had been broken and stolen. 
And after Barbara was murdered, a neighbor who was questioned claimed he hadn't seen anything strange going on on their property besides a mailbox being replaced. So the incident with the mailbox must have been recent enough to still be fresh in his memory. The most creepy thing of all, though, is the day before Barbara was murdered, she and a friend were having lunch at her house when they saw a man in a ski mask walking from the left of the front windows, looking inside the house, and then going down the driveway towards East Wharf Road. Um, So that's creepy. And Barbara's friend claimed that they never called the police. You know, they never reported it. Now, these dinner parties for the tables would often be held at someone's house. So it stands to reason that Barbara had hosted the group at her home before. More, more than once, probably. Maybe one of the women who had felt scammed gave her husband or her brother or her boyfriend or her father the address, and he goes over there to make Barbara pay. But he finds out she's not alone on this day. It's too risky. Um, she's having lunch with a friend, so he kind of just looks in the window and and he leaves. But he also notices that Barbara lives in a very affluent area. She lives in a very nice house. And it seems like she has money, which makes him even more angry. So he vows to return the next day to take his revenge. It's very possible one of the women who invested $5,000 and felt taken advantage of could have done it herself, too. What is even more strange is this was the day Barbara told her friend that she was due in court at 2 p.m. the afternoon of the 3rd instead of in the morning, as was usual. Are these two things connected? Madison felt that they might be. He speculated that maybe someone had been watching his mother, keeping track of her routine. This person would know that 16-year-old Allie would be out of the house during the day at school and that Barbara would be alone. Maybe this person even knew that Barbara had a court date scheduled and it was going to be a big one for her. She would finally either be getting the money owed to her or see her ex-husband behind bars. So she might have mentioned it to some friends or the women at her table. So maybe her attacker called her after showing up to her house in a ski mask and finding she had company. Maybe he or she pretended to be a court clerk and told her that the time for court had changed the next day so they could make sure she was home and alone. I mean, to be honest, this is a theory that might fit with Jeffrey Hamburg being the guy as well. Maybe he has shown up in a ski mask hoping to get the job done and not have to worry about what would happen at court the next day. And he had to change his plans because Barbara had company. Barbara dying on March 3rd would be very convenient for Jeff. But if she was still alive on March 3rd and she showed up to court at the right time, it could be very inconvenient for him. But for some reason, Barbara thought the time for court had changed. And it's a mystery why she thought that. Now, luckily, Madison's FOIA request has been approved, even though Detective Sudik tried so hard to not let it be approved. It was approved, and I imagine he'll be taking a nice long look at her cell phone records for the date of March 2nd to see who called her and from where. Now, chances are this person most likely used a payphone or a burner phone, but it's still something. It's still a place to start. By the way, after Barbara's death, shit hit the fan for Jill Platt and Donna Bello. So it's reported that Donna Bello had actually reached the dessert level five times damn like i can't i'm just sitting here thinking about like how much untaxed cash donna had sitting in her freezer right but she was actually put on trial she was found guilty and she was initially sentenced to serve six years in a federal prison but on appeal it was decided her sentence was too harsh for her role and she was only given two years Now, prosecutors say Bello made at least $400,000 during her time at the tables, but her lawyer claimed she didn't profit from this at all. She did it for philanthropic reasons to give back to people. Well, Bello's co-defendant and Barbara's aunt, Jill Platt, was actually sentenced to 30 months in prison, which was reduced from 54 months on appeal. And it's very likely that had Barbara not died, she would have been caught up in this investigation as well, being that she was in the dessert position. Now we turn to Barbara's big sister, Conway Beach. So we have some complicated relationships here, as sibling relationships often are, um, but this one especially. Early in the documentary, Conway Beach described her younger sister Barbara as amazing, smart, beautiful. When they were growing up, all the girls wanted to be friends with Barbara, and all the boys wanted to date her. And in general, it seemed like Conway had always felt a little bit like the odd one out amongst her brothers and sisters. 
her siblings would all get straight A's in school, and Conway could barely pass tests. And she felt it was obvious not only to her, but everyone else, too. She would even get asked by teachers in school, like, are you sure you're a beach? You know, you're so different than your siblings. So that must have been tough as a young girl. Growing up in a family of high achievers, the fact that teachers would even say that to her kind of agitates me, even if they were joking, because it's a little bit like picking at someone's already existing insecurities, but that's a story for another day. So Conway's brother, Richard, remembered that Conway was always a little more high maintenance than the others, and he referred to her as a fragile bull. So I expect that he means she was sensitive, but as far as the bull part, I think it could mean one of two things. She was fragile, but she could also be strong. Or she was like a bull in a china shop, destroying everything in her sight. And based on what we come to know about Conway, either of my guesses could be correct. Conway said that she started drinking heavily at the age of 13, and she was a blackout drunk. She lost control of herself and her life pretty quickly after that. Conway eventually would go on to have her own son, Tyler, and she became a single mother at a very young age. And this was before Barbara gave birth to either Madison or Allie. But in the 90s, Conway was struggling with substance abuse, and she was in a very bad place. And we all know when a person is under the weight of alcohol, drugs, or both— There's not a lot of them left over to give to anyone else, even to their own children. Tyler remembered life with his mother wasn't great during this time, but his Aunt Barbara was always there to swoop in and rescue him. She would bring him to her house and show him that there was more to life than what he was seeing at home. In the documentary, Conway commented that her son Tyler was Barbara's first baby, at least in Barbara's eyes. And Tyler also told his cousin Madison in the documentary that Barbara was more of a mother to him than an aunt. He said she'd always treated him like one of her own children. In 1996, Conway was in a really bad place with drugs and alcohol, and she kind of just left. She left her family, she left her son, and she went to Florida, where Jeffrey Hamburg claims she was doing drugs and hanging out with pimps. (laughs) Now, at this point, Barbara and Jeffrey appeared to have taken Conway to court, I assume to get custody of Conway's son, Tyler, who had been left behind, and who they were caring for. And even though Conway was in the throes of a bender, in the throes of addiction, this got her attention, and she was not too happy about it. Conway admitted to Madison while being interviewed for the documentary that she was livid, and she began making plans to take money out of her 401k and hire a hitman to kill not only her sister Barbara, but Jeff as well, and Barbara and Jeff's kids, Madison and Allie. And I have to tell you, when I heard her say this in the film, my mouth legitimately dropped open. And that rarely happens in real life. Like if I was a cartoon, my jaw would have hit the floor because think about this. She's sitting there in front of her nephew whose mother has been murdered. And she's saying, yeah, I wanted to have your mom killed and I was going to have you killed too because I was so angry. And he was just a kid when this happened, right? So And obviously, Conway admits, you know, she was so messed up on drugs and alcohol, she wasn't thinking straight. And this is totally understandable. But to have openly admitted this to him, that would be really tough for everyone involved. I can't even imagine. Conway said at this point she's living in Florida and she starts asking everyone where she could hire a hitman. She asks taxi drivers and bartenders. And eventually she actually set a meeting with a hitman and they were supposed to meet in the bar of a hotel she was staying at. But according to Conway, she never remembered meeting this person because she began drinking at the bar while she was waiting for him. And then she blacked out. And the next thing she knew, she was waking up in her hotel room with no clothes on and all her money stolen. Now, once her sister Barbara was murdered, Conway told the police about what had happened, that she tried to hire a hitman to have her sister killed, and she claims that she had also told Barbara before she died. And being an alcoholic herself, Barbara had not been angry. She had understood how something like that could have happened. So let's examine this for a moment. Obviously, we see where the resentment might have come from because many times those who are dealing with addiction claim that they never stop loving the people in their lives. They just no longer have control of their actions and they end up hurting these people even though they don't want to. So Conway did love her son Tyler, but she just she just didn't know how to be a good mother at that point. And her sister flew in to save the day. Always the good sister. 
always the one that everyone wanted to be friends with, always the fun sister who made everyone feel good and who got to marry a rich husband and who got to travel the world. And Conway's over here feeling like the black sheep since, you know, day one. And now she was losing her son to Barbara as well. Just one more thing that was being taken away from her when Barbara already had so much. A rich husband, a beautiful home, the ability to fly off and go to a different country at the drop of a hat. And I guess the question is, if Conway had managed to stay lucid for her meeting with this hitman, would she have gone through with it? Is there a possibility that even though she doesn't remember, she did talk to this guy and tell him what she wanted and that's why she woke up with her money gone because he had taken it as payment? Now, I honestly doubt that. This was 1996, 14 years before Barbara Hamburg would be murdered, and I don't think any hitman is waiting that long to accomplish his task. Additionally, there's a good chance that he wasn't even a real hitman. Anyways, it reminds me of Horrible Bosses when the three main characters are trying to find someone to take out their bosses and they meet the guy in the bar whose name I wish I could say because it's hilarious, but they meet the guy in the bar and he says, um, yeah, you know, give me this much money and I will take care of this for you. And then they give him the money and he's like, okay. So now I'm going to tell you how to do this yourself, you know. More than likely, the person she met with was just some guy on the wrong side of the law who heard this girl was asking around town for a hitman and he thought he would take advantage of the situation. However, just the fact that she even once considered it is kind of scary. So I asked a few friends who have gone through really bad battles with addiction and they said yes. It's actually very possible for someone who's going through this to think about killing those who have wronged them or who are standing in the way of, you know, them being drug addicts. So this isn't just exclusive to Conway, you know, this is pretty standard for for people who are, you know, really badly addicted to drugs. However, aside from Jeffrey Hamburg, it seems like Conway is the only one who doesn't really have an alibi, at least not a strong or verifiable one. She claims the morning of her sister's murder, she was with her Aunt Jill Platt's mother, who they called Nat. Okay, so Conway's Aunt Jill, Jill's mother, (laughs) whose name was Nat. And this is another layer of complication. So after Conway got cleaned up, she also went through a lot of stuff. Um, She had breast cancer. She got a brain tumor. She had to get brain surgery. Her husband left her. She had a nervous breakdown. It was just bad. This woman's had a really hard life. So Barbara took her in so she could help Conway get back on her feet and also care for her while she recovered from brain surgery. However, eventually it seemed like maybe Conway was taking advantage of Barbara a little bit. According to an anonymous woman who was interviewed by Madison during the series, Barbara really wanted to help her sister Conway, but there came a point when she was struggling herself and Conway was just kind of being a burden and not really helping out. So Barbara asked Conway to leave and then Conway moved in with Jill Platt's 90-year-old mother, Nat. And on the day of the murder, Conway said she was with Nat in the basement of Nat's house, helping her clean it out. Now, obviously, if Nat was 90 in 2010, she's no longer with us today. And it's unclear as to whether or not the police talked to Nat at this time to confirm whether or not Conway had been with her that morning or, you know, what time she left. Conway said she left when Allie started texting her from school saying she couldn't get a hold of Barbara and that she wanted to go home. And something else I found odd from the documentary was that Conway said since the murder, she's carried a hammer in her car for protection. And that took me aback a little bit because, as we know, one of the suspected murder weapons was a hammer. But Conway had her own theory for a long time about who took her sister Barbara's life. Conway was 100% sure that it was Barbara's 16-year-old daughter, Allie. Conway thought it was strange the way Allie immediately assumed it was a crime scene, even before they found the body or any blood. Conway also thought it was strange that Allie tried to do CPR on her mother's body, getting a lot of blood on herself in the process, even though it was the belief of the police department that Barbara had been attacked coming home from dropping Allie at school. Conway felt that maybe it had gone differently. Maybe Allie had attacked Barbara on their way out and then walked to school as she had done many times before. Conway says she knows that at this time Allie was doing drugs and drinking alcohol and as someone who had made bad choices before while under the influence, Conway felt 
that Allie would have been capable of anything, especially since she'd been acting so disrespectfully to her mother in the months leading up to Barbara's murder, and she was still upset about the fact that Barbara had allegedly wanted to have her committed. There was also a life insurance policy on the line that Allie would have financially benefited from in the event of her mother's death. So Conway was very insistent throughout the majority of this docuseries that Allie was the culprit. She even outright told Madison, like, I believe your sister did this. Additionally, after her mother's murder, Allie left Connecticut. Not only that, she left the country and traveled around South America for a time before settling in Argentina, where she began attending college for engineering. Allie did not return to Madison until her brother started interviewing people for the documentary. So that seems suspicious to Conway that her niece had just fled the country after the murder. However, As the documentary went on, we find that although Allie may have had the motive, i.e. anger, resentment, and, you know, money, she really didn't have the means or the opportunity. Madison and the private investigator, like I said, they did this restaging of the murder for the film, and if everything went down the way it seems to have gone down, the way the police believe it went down, Barbara would have been initially attacked or startled at the front door. She would have then run down the yard towards the street and been taken down in the yard where the pallet was found covering up blood. That means someone would have needed to drag her body from the place where she was killed to the place where her body was found, around the back of the house. And Madison didn't believe that his tiny 16-year-old sister would have had the physical strength to do so. And I don't believe that she would have either. Additionally, the administrator at the school remembered Barbara checking Allie into school that morning. She'd even talked to her for a few minutes at the time of check-in. So timeline wouldn't really work unless Allie had somehow snuck out of school without anyone seeing, walked home, killed her mother, and then walked back to school and entered without anyone seeing. Additionally, the police told Madison that their main suspect had turned their phone off at the time of the murder, as well as afterwards for about a 24-hour period. And we know that neither Allie or Conway's phones were turned off that day since they were communicating with each other about Allie getting picked up from school. And that brings us back to Jeffrey Hamburg. If Barbara dropped Allie off at school at 7.54 a.m., that would put her back home sometime between 8.05 or 8.10 assuming she didn't go anywhere else first, which she doesn't seem to have. So sometime after 8.10 is when she must have been killed. Now, Jeffrey Hamburg was at the New Haven courthouse by probably 9.15 or so. Would he have had the opportunity to kill his wife, hide the body, and get to New Haven in time? I imagine the way she was left, there would have been a lot of blood, so he most likely would have needed to clean up as well. From 44 Middle Beach Road to the New Haven courthouse, it's a 29-minute drive. And I assume on a weekday early in the morning, it's probably going to take a little bit longer because there's a lot of people commuting to work. So if it was Jeffrey himself, he most likely would have been facing a very snug timeline to complete the murder, cover the body, clean himself up, and get to the courthouse. It's possible, I guess, but it would have been tight. Now, that's not to say that Jeff couldn't have brought a third party in, someone who could do the killing for him while he showed up at the courthouse giving himself an alibi, but the way Barbara was killed doesn't say to me that this was hired out. As I said in the first video, it seemed very personal, overly violent, very hands-on. And in the aftermath, Jeffrey's behavior was the most suspicious. He wasn't around. And it might lead someone to believe that since the police couldn't find him, his phone was off. Now, the Madison Police Department did admit that they spoke to Jeffrey by phone on Wednesday, the day after the murder. But they did not specify it was his phone that they'd spoken to him on. And by this time, he'd already retained a criminal defense attorney. They could have easily talked to Jeff on his lawyer's phone, and his phone could have still been off. And they said the DNA didn't match, but we do have the police also admitting that the DNA kits were crap and expired. And they also said that DNA from Hamburg lineage was found under Barbara's fingernails. Madison wasn't in town, and I don't believe Barbara had contact with any other male member of the Hamburg family because that would be Jeff's family. So how did DNA from a Hamburg male get under her fingernails? Um, I called Derek Levasseur, my co-host on the Crime Weekly podcast, also a retired police officer, and I asked, you know, how long would someone 
have someone else's DNA under their fingernails. And he says, you know, it depends on a lot how clean someone is, how often they wash their hands, stuff like that. But it really wouldn't be normal for DNA to be under someone else's fingernails unless they had some sort of violent or sexual encounter. And even if someone did have another person's DNA under their fingernails, after washing their hands a few times, washing dishes, um, you know, showering, stuff like that, that DNA would be washed out. It would be gone. So in our opinion, Derek and I, the DNA would have had to have been placed there pretty recently before her murder. So if it's true that male Hamburg DNA was found under Barbara's fingernails, that does not look good for her ex-husband because they were going through such a contentious divorce and court battles. And I just don't see why they would have been physically around each other at any point in the past few days or even the past few weeks. And even if they had, I can't imagine that she would be touching him, much less scratching him, and DNA doesn't get under your fingernails just from touching or hugging someone. Now, luckily, as I said, at the end of the last episode, Madison's FOIA request was granted, and he now has access to the police reports and records. If I was him, the first place I would start is to see whose phone was shut off that day. I would also go through Barbara's phone records and find out all the numbers who called her the day before her murder and check each one to see which call might have been the one during which she was told the court time had changed. I would also look through her social media accounts to see if she'd received any threatening messages or emails from a person she'd brought into the gifting tables or from someone related to one of these women involved. Angry messages, messages asking for their money back, etc. Because if it wasn't her husband, I think it's a good chance that her murder had something to do with her involvement in the tables. I think that with this new information, a lot more is going to be made clear going forward and this mystery will hopefully become less of one and hopefully even get solved. So now I hand it off to you. What do you think about this case? Who's your number one suspect? Give me your thoughts about it in the comment section. I can't wait to, to hear what you have to say about it. Remember to follow me on social media, Instagram, Twitter. Remember to uh, subscribe to the podcast, Crime Weekly, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcasts, we're there. And also don't forget to subscribe because a lot of people watch my videos all the time, but they haven't subscribed yet. So subscribe so you can get notified every time I post a new video. Like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. And I will see you very, very soon. Stay kind. Stay beautiful. Bye. What a living don't break now. And the bottle's going straight down. And that river runs deep. The mouths get steep and the voice is getting too loud. Oh, this feeling's out of every. It's looking like a cemetery. They're going back from the grave. Let's get a new slowly And so you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings